on the screen. Uh, this morning we'll let you turn in your Bible. Uh, we're going to start in Matthew 28. I have several passages of Scripture that I want to share with you. Matthew 28. Vacation Bible School is our largest uh, evangelistic outreach that we do at the church. It costs, I don't know how much. Some churches it costs thousands. I'm sure we have a couple of thousand dollars wrapped up in Vacation Bible School every year, at least. Uh, so I want to talk to you about evangelism. Uh, if I was to ask you the question, but since we're online and they can't answer and, and they're going to want to answer and this isn't Jeopardy or anything like that, uh, if I were to ask you what evangelism was, some of you may know, uh, but evangelism is just simply sharing. It comes from the, the, the word euangelion, which means to share the gospel or the good news. And evangelism is just simply that, sharing the gospel. Now we're going to start in Matthew 28, but I want to read several other passages of scripture to you. And I want to talk to you as a church about uh, keeping evangelism a priority. Keeping evangelism a priority. Okay? Uh, sometimes we, we well, I, I don't want to say we. I have to try to make myself from time to time pause and remember what life was like before I was saved. Now, I don't mean all the mischievous or evil things that I was doing, but the fear that I had of God, uh, the fear of, of going to hell. Uh, I, I don't know how old I was when I realized that heaven and hell were a reality. God revealed that to me. Uh, I didn't, certainly didn't learn a whole lot uh, in church, although I was exposed to church from time to time. Uh, but God impressed upon me, whether it was through somebody sharing Christ with me or maybe through a church service. But I was at a young age, and I realized that heaven was real and hell was real. And I also knew that I had no hope of going to heaven the way that I was acting and living. Uh, because friends and, and other people shared Christ with me. I eventually received Christ. You've heard that story, and I would say that the church got a prophecy. I'm, I'm glad of that. Uh, but sometimes I, I, I don't spend enough time remembering the fear that I had of not making it to heaven. Now, why would that be important? Because if you're lost, that is a reality. If God is dealing with you and he's convicting you of your sins, one of the things that comes with that conviction is an awareness that you're not going to heaven. And, and God can impress upon you the truth of his word that there's a heaven and a hell. And if you don't know Christ for salvation, you're not going to make it to heaven. That's a very scary thought. Uh, and if we remember that there are people outside of the church walls, and maybe sometimes in the church walls, maybe here this morning that don't know Christ, uh, there are people that are living in that fear. So the role of the church, although we do a lot of things and we should do all of them well, uh, like missions, ministry, worship, uh, all of these things. Evangelism is the priority of the church. It is the command that God has given to the church. And we should always make sure that we, we focus our resources, our manpower, finances, our assets, buildings, property, whatever, is, is geared toward not just worship, but reaching the lost. Bringing lost people to come to know Christ. Our two young men, I, I'm just going to call them our resident missionaries. Uh, Matt and Ben just came back from overseas, and I, I had the opportunity to ask Matt a little bit. I think it was Matt. They both looked so much alike. It could have been Ben for an hour I talked to, and I know it was Matt. Um, he was telling me how, how challenging it was to be overseas and to share Christ and, and how they got kicked out of one town. They just didn't want to hear it because they were sharing the gospel, and they were told that they had to leave. Uh, so not everybody wants to hear the gospel, but it's the job of the church, the calling of the church. To share the gospel, to be involved in evangelism. Now, I, before I go too much farther, let me kind of let you off the hook. And there's some preachers that would stone me for, for putting it this way. I hope I, I say it clearly. I used to hear that we should all be involved in evangelism. There's some things that I'm better at than others. It may or may not surprise you that I can go into almost any crowd and talk to almost any person, but I'm nervous in a crowd. Uh, but if I have the opportunity to share Christ, if they have the opportunity to sit down with an individual or a group of people and share the gospel or open up the Word of God and teach the Word of God. I, I'm in my element. That's what God has gifted me to do. There are a lot of things that I enjoy doing, but they're not gifts. Uh, I mean, I, I like to camp, but, you know, I'm, I'm still afraid of snakes, so I walk around and I tiptoe. I'm a little nervous, you know. Big animals out in the woods, they still make me a little bit nervous. And I, I, I'm not sure I, that Kodiak bears live in North Carolina or South Carolina, but I still camp like they exist. You know, I carry all kind of firearms in case that big beast attacks me. I, I'm not a good golfer, but I like to golf once in a while. I'm not a great uh, fisherman. I'm not an avid hunter. I used to bird hunt a lot. Uh, I, I was never really great at any of that. I enjoyed doing some things. But I know that preaching and teaching the Word of God is not just a calling for me. God has given me a gift 
uh, to retain the word, to share the word, to explain the word. And I really enjoy it. On Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, we st stand up, or I stand up here, and, and I let people ask questions. I do my best to answer them. And if I don't know the answer, I'll say, look, I don't know the answer. Why don't you ask O'Neill? O'Neill knows everything. No, uh, give me time to research it, and I'll come back with the answer. And I'll, I'll be glad to share that with you. No, O'Neill's up top. He's not down here. I saw some people looking. You don't see his ball that he's up top, okay? Uh, but I, I don't know all the answers, but I enjoy teaching. Now, what I enjoy more than just teaching the Word of God is sitting down with somebody who's younger or older, makes no difference, and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, of all the messages that I enjoy preaching, I enjoy preaching the Word of God. We should preach the whole counsel of God's Word. There's more of it that I don't understand than what I do understand, but we should preach all of God's Word, and there's some things that make me nervous about the Word of God. I'm not great with revelation because I was so wrapped up with Him one time, but, but of all the messages that I preach, when I can tell somebody the basics of salvation. I enjoy that the most because I think that there's a potential of two things happening. Christians remembering that they were lost and now that they're saved and that will spark a, 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 a fire in their heart, not just to do evangelism, but to praise the Lord for their salvation. Or maybe somebody's listening and they are lost. And they'll hear that I'm not better than them just because I'm saved. You're not better than them just because you're saved. Uh, we were all in need of Jesus Christ forgiving us of our sins. We're all in need of, of God's grace. And when I share a gospel message, I, I always hope that somebody hears that. And whether they come to an altar and respond or go home and they receive Christ or they ask Christ to save them on the way home or they're eating lunch, I, I look forward to God working in their hearts. I love preaching evangelistic messages because that's when you see lives really transformed. From their destiny being hell itself to being heaven. I, I, I like that. Somebody making a decision as Christ to impact every aspect of their life. From their marriage to their money. Everything about their life can be changed. So I love preaching evangelistic messages. And I think that when a church keeps evangelism as a priority, they'll see lives changed. Young people, old people, makes no difference. They'll see lives changed. Uh, and, and it'll cause and bring about an excitement that only God can bring. So I'm going to share this with you, several verses of Scripture, and, and I hope that I keep this very simple, very plain. If you're lost this morning, I hope that you'll really seriously consider coming to know Christ as your Savior. If you're already a believer, thank God, and, and maybe you'll remember what it was like to be lost, and it'll motivate you to share Christ with somebody else. Mark, I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 28, uh, the Great Commission. I'm going to read verses 18 through 20. I had these highlighted, but for some reason on an iPad, you can only... Keep so much highlighted, and then it just deletes those highlights. So I guess I have too much highlighted on my iPad. Matthew 28, I think I'm going to be reading 18 through 20. I hope that's how this comes out. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. To the end of the age, even to the end of the age, this age, until Christ returns, this is what we're supposed to do. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 4. It's not going to be in exact order, but Acts chapter 4. Uh, and I just want to read one verse there. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts 4, 12. I'll give you time to turn there as I scroll on my iPad, okay? I like this verse. I, I really wanted to read more than this in, in, in Acts chapter but Acts chapter 4 verse 12 and there is salvation in no one else uh, sometimes college students go off and they hear that Christianity is not real uh, the Bible is just a book of fables uh, they, by the way they teach the Bible in China uh, but the goal is they teach the Bible in China they tell them it's just a book of myths uh, and a bunch of stories uh, and then when they hear somebody tell them that it's true, they have this um, background and this, this, this ground that has already been set for them that it's just myths and a bunch of stories. That's not the only country, but uh, that's one of the things they do in China. They teach the Bible, and they tell everybody that it's just not true. Uh, sometimes in, in America, our young people go off to college, and they're confronted by professors, and they're told that the Bible is just a bunch of myths. It's not true. It's not real. It, it happens. So somebody might ask, well, why are you a Christian? What makes Christianity better than anything else? Well, the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, proves that it's better than any other religion out there, okay? Our God came down to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, the form of a man. He sacrificed his life for us. He was buried. He was resurrected three days later. And then some days later, he ascended back to the Father, and he's going to come again. That is the greatest truth in Scripture. 
Uh, and there's no other religion that teaches that the God that they're worshiping sacrificed so much to deliver them from their sins. It's always a works mentality. They have to try to please some God. So here in Acts chapter 4, it says this, And there is salvation in no one else. There's no other religion. There's no other doctrine. There's no other science or philosophy that can bring you to a point of salvation. Apart from Jesus Christ alone. It does not exist. Now you might not believe that. You might reject that. But you cannot disprove that. You might say you don't want to accept that. And you might fall into this trap of saying. Well that is your truth. But that's not my truth. There's only one truth. And this is the truth of God's word. You might say well I don't believe that that's God's word. That is fine. And only God can change your mind on that. But I'm telling you the truth. Based on God's word. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name. Under heaven. Given among men. By which we must be saved. There's a lot packed in that one verse. We must be saved. Only one person can save us. And that is Jesus Christ. And there's no other hope given among men for their salvation. That is it. Only Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, 27 and 28. Hebrews chapter 9, 27 and 28. Turn there if you will. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. I was just going to read 27, but I'm going to read 27 28. It's all I can do not to read all of uh, the verses following verse 27. There's a lot there. It's really a beautiful passage. And I'd encourage you to read it for yourself if you're interested in that. But, well, all of chapter 9 actually is what I was referring to. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once. I'll wait. You're turning. You're obedient and bringing your Bible. I appreciate you doing that. I'll give you time to turn. You might want to mark this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. The King James says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. ESV is a little different. And just as it is appointed for man to die once. Someone asked me this week if I believed in ghosts. I said, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I believe in ghosts. I believe in evil spirits. Uh, now there might be angels that God would send to speak to you. I believe that as well. Uh, if you're going to believe in evil spirits and they're real... I also believe in angels, so I guess if you're going to say there's a ghost, it depends on what the ghost is doing. If he's knocking over my dishes and saying, boo, when I'm in the shower, uh, that's not God, okay? Uh, <laughs> you know, if they're telling me that I'm a handsome guy and I'm doing great, that's got to be an angel. God does that, right? Uh, but, someone asked if I believe in ghosts, I said, oh yeah, they scare me too. I want to even watch a scary movie. Don't even tell me about Friday the 13th. Watched it once, didn't camp for a decade. No, not going to do it. No, no. Some people say, you want to watch something that's scary? No, not going to watch it. Well, we can have popcorn. I don't care if you have popcorn, I'm leaving. <laughs> Ask me to spend the night at your house, put a scary movie on, I'm gone. Because I think once you die, that's it. I don't want to hear about demons and all that mess. I don't want to be near them. Some people think that you're going to be reincarnated. You get a second chance. Not going to happen. You get one chance. You go around in this world one time. You're going to die physically. And after you die physically, you're going to face the judgment. If you're a believer, it's a different judgment. You're going to receive war, rewards for the works that you have done. We'll cast them right back at Jesus' feet, but we'll be uh, rewarded for serving the Lord. If you're lost, that judgment is totally different. It, it's the same pain as going to court and the judge saying that you were sentenced to life in prison. And that scares me. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once, he only died once for our sins, okay? Having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Christ is going to come again and deliver his children. If you're not alive for the rapture, you will experience physical death. If you know Christ is your Savior, thank the Lord. You'll instantly, your spirit will be with the Lord. What a blessing. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you will not be with the Lord. Instantly, you will begin to be punished. Instantly. Right away. That's going to happen. Okay? But it is appointed unto man once to die, then to face the judgment. That means we don't have forever in dealing with our loved ones. We, don't, we can't just take our time in sharing Christ with our neighbors. We can't act like we have tomorrow. We don't always have tomorrow. We, we don't know that we have the next moment. 
When I was sitting in my office this morning and the power flickered and the power went out and then it came back on and then it went back out, I'm thinking, well, any minute now something's going to go boom. <laughs> you know, something's going to blow up. We, we, we never know what might happen in our lives. We have no clue how long we're going to live. And we don't know how long somebody else is going to be with us. Here today, gone. Not even tomorrow. Here today and then gone. It can happen that way. So we cannot walk around and act like, well, we'll just put this off for another time. Look, I, I get asked to see people on a regular basis. The phone calls that scare me the most are not the ones when somebody says, well, so-and-so has had a heart attack uh, and they might not make it. If they're a believer, I'm thinking, well, at least they're saved and I'll get to the hospital as quick as I can or to the home and I'll pray with them. But it's the phone call that says, I need you to come see so-and-so, they are lost. Why would that bother me more than any other phone call? Well, because apparently at that moment, that individual may be willing to listen. And they might lose that desire tomorrow. They might lose that desire in the next hour. I, I don't have forever. I need to strike while the iron is hot. Or somebody may call me and say they need me to come share Christ with somebody because they're on the verge of suicide. And yes, I've received those phone calls. So we cannot play around like we have forever to share Christ with somebody. Because we don't. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Now, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians, this just reinforces some of what I just said. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Of all the churches that Paul wrote to, he had more problems with the church in Corinth than any other location. It was a uh, city that was full of wickedness and evil and uh, worshiping false gods and sex gods and all of these types of things were going. It was a very wicked place and Paul was uh, successful. The Lord worked through him and many people were saved and they established a church and Paul had to write to them more than once and we believe he may have had a third letter that was sent to them but God didn't preserve it uh, so it's not here in scripture for, for whatever reason God knows. But we have two letters written to the church of Corinth. And in these letters, he not only corrects them, but more than once he tells them, you need to act now on the message that you're hearing. You need to start chewing meat and not just drinking milk. You need to grow in your faith, but also you need to make sure that you're sharing Christ in this wicked society with people. They need to hear the truth. It's another one of those examples. 2 Corinthians I don't know what chapter I said, but if I didn't say chapter 6, I apologize. Chapter 6, verse 2 and verse 11. <coughs> Excuse me. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I mean, if your parents ask you to do something. Uh, I used to... You know, I, I, I still get frustrated when I, hear, when I hear parents tell their children to do something and then immediately start to teach them math. You know, I, I say do it and then they say one, two. I, I never count. I would look at my children and say, I, I need you to do so and so. If they didn't do it, I would look at them early in their life. I said, now when are you expected to obey your parents? And I taught them to say the first time. And I only did that a couple of times to teach them. And after that, they realized that if I don't obey my father the first time, I'm going to get a whipping. Now, I would only spank them twice. I was very disciplined when I whipped them. I, I had a piece of leather strap that I took off a belt. I cut them. Actually, I cut about nine or ten, and I'll tell you why in just a second. I cut about nine or ten pieces of leather, and I had them all around the house. Because no matter where I was, I wanted to be able to grab that piece of leather and say, okay, bend over. I'm going to spank you twice, and I'm going to slap them twice in the butt. And that was it. I disciplined myself because I grew up abused, and I wanted them to know. That's all you're going to get is two pots. Now, if you put your fingers in the way, they might break, and that doesn't count as one. I'm still going to smack you two times. Now, why did that cut to me? Because God knew John was coming into this world. <laughs> that joker went all around that house and grabbed every single strap of leather he could find. and said, how are you going to spank me now, Daddy? And I thought, I'm going to kill you, boy. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> but I would tell him, now is the time to obey. And for you who are lost to hear the gospel, now is the time to respond. <laughs> no matter how many times I say it, I can say, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You might not hear that. You may not listen to that. You're convinced. You've got plans for this afternoon. You're convinced you're going to go home and eat that pot roast. I, I, I don't know. But you don't know how long you're going to live. The second verse, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. 
We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. What Paul said was, we have poured everything into this message. We want you to know that we care about you. And, and we are burdened for you. We want you to listen to us. Our hearts are wide open. There's nothing else inside of us. We've thrown everything at you that God has led us to throw at you, to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're pleading with you to respond. Here on this sign, you can see it says Romans chapter 12, verse 2. But Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you, or I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So he's pleading with them. Please listen to God speaking to your heart. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He said, please listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ and turn away from your wicked lifestyle and come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord said. Paul said, I'm begging you by all the mercy and grace of God to hear the message and respond to it. And that is the same attitude that the church should have in society. Not going out in the world and saying, you are lost and you're sinful and you're going to hell and there's no hope. Or you're lost and you're sinful and you should find yourself in church and fill a pew. That's not the message that God wants us to share. He wants us to go out and say, I'm no different than you. I was lost in my sins. I was lost and, and I had no hope. And Christ convicted me of my sins and he drew me unto myself. That is, he convinced me that he loved me and he caused me to, to make a profession of faith in him. And now I am saved by his grace uh, through faith and I'm thankful for that and I'm no different than you. Christ can save you as well. Please listen to that message. That's what Paul is saying. I poured and we have poured our hearts out to you. It, it's just bared wide open. There's nothing to hide. All of our emotion, all of our energy is here to tell you, you need Christ. That should be the mission and the priority of the church. I've said this before and for a little while I had to repent. I said, there's nobody in this world that I don't want to share Christ with or there's nobody in this world that I want to die without Christ. And then 9-11 happened and there was a period of time that I thought God sent somebody or anybody else other than me to witness to a Muslim. I just can't do it. And God convicted me. It took a while. He convicted me. He put me in touch with the Rona Coloco. He owned some planes that I rented at the Lumberton Airport, a Muslim. I thought, well, he might be Muslim. I'm just renting his planes. I don't need to share Christ with him. I mean, Lord, you know what happened on 9-11. I don't need to do that. And then I took John to the airport one day. John flew with me. And after John flew with me, Arona Coloco began to talk to my son. The next thing you know, John is outside of the hangar and he's playing soccer with Arona Coloco. And I thought, how can I hate this guy who's being so nice to my son? He said, I don't want to tell him about Christ. I don't want to do it. And God began to convict me. So after John and I left, and the next time we went to rent a plane, I said, Arona, I need to talk to you about something. I know you have different beliefs than me. And I do blame the Muslims for attacking us on 9-11. And Arono, you fall into that category. And I know what your religion teaches about how you're supposed to kill the infidels and how you don't like people who don't believe in your faith. But I just want to take a moment to tell you that not only am I renting your planes, God is convicting me and I need to tell you about Jesus Christ. You may never respond to Christ for salvation. <coughs> but I want you to know that Jesus Christ died for your sins and he can save you if you'll ever ask him to. Do you know how difficult that was for me? Think it made a difference. Arona Coloco had a stroke. He has since passed away, but Arona Coloco had a stroke, and before he passed away, I got a phone call that said, Arona would love to talk to you. We should pour our hearts out to people. And as a church, we need to realize that there are people that are lost all around us. And don't set up barriers and walls and say, no, no, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. Now, here's where I want to let you off the hook just a little bit. And this is what I was going to say earlier. And some preacher would stone me for saying this. Maybe your gift is not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I shared with you, mine, mine is. I enjoy it. Well, then invite them to church. And tell them that you want them to come to church so they can hear the gospel. Or ask them if you can call your preacher and maybe he can come and share Christ with them. I'll let you off the hook. Maybe it's not your gift. Maybe you're a little nervous and you're afraid they're going to ask you all kind of biblical questions that you can't answer. Well, I can't answer all of them either. I know that most of the time they're just a distraction. And I bring them right back to, well, I, I know that you're worried about creation. And you might be worried about evolution. And you might be worried, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, about the book of Revelation. But let's talk a little bit about salvation. Let me, let me ask you about you confessing your sins. I bring them right back to the matter. So if you can't do it yourself, call me. 
I'll go. I'll meet with you. The church should keep evangelism a priority. Several things I'm going to give you based on what I just read. This is just the introduction, so settle down. Here we go. We have a unique message. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There's no other name. No other name apart from Jesus. Whereby men must be saved. Now you catch a unique giraffe. Unique up on them. So this is a unique message. Y'all don't have to laugh. That is the corniest dad joke I have ever heard in my life. I just threw that in there to wake you up. Y'all are thinking, he's lost his mind now. Long time ago, I've been functioning like this for years. We have a unique message. There's nothing else like it. Nothing. I only said that to get your attention. Jerry's back there shaking and said, that boy's lost his mind. <laughs> there's no other religion that teaches there's only one way to heaven apart from Christ. Because of the work that he has done. He can save anybody. I learned this saying when I first went into ministry. And I was very arrogant when I first went into ministry. I'm, I'm a little less arrogant now. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. I needed to hear that. Because when God called me into ministry, he called me out of a lost home. And I thought, well, I'm better than them. That's pure pride. It's pure arrogance. You know when my family started to come to know Christ? When God broke my pride. And I told them, I know how bad I was at home. And Jesus saved me. Mom, he can save you. James, my oldest brother, he can save you. Van, he can save you. Michelle, he can save you. I told them all. Robert, he's the only one in my family right now, only one of the siblings that's not yet saved. You know, they didn't want to hear it when I was arrogant. We have a unique message. Jesus can save anybody. If you understand that, say amen. amen. You may have somebody in your home that is turned off by church because somebody was arrogant. Maybe about the way they live, the sins that they may have committed, the sins they may be committing, the way they dress, whether or not they go to this church or that church, the way they talk, the translation of the Bible, the money that they have. Maybe something has turned them off from church. You just tell them simply God can save them. They're no worse than you were. We're all in need of salvation. We have a limited opportunity. Hebrews 9, 27. Now is the day of salvation. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Now is the time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Right now. So let me apply quickly. Just because I think the Spirit is leading me to close this service out. Somebody probably needs to come and pray. All our authority comes from Christ. We share the gospel as a church because Christ told us to do it. Our personal responsibility and our responsibility as a church also comes from Christ. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go you, therefore. You go. You share. The scope of our ministry is worldwide. You know, there's some nations right now that I'm not happy with. I don't like what they're doing to Israel. I don't like what they're doing to Americans. I don't like the way that they're threatening us. I, I just don't like it. If they would just give me 23 hours, not 24, just 23, because I'd probably need to, you know, at least, you know, stay calm for a moment because I'd start a nuclear war. Just 23 hours of being the president, I would just, I'd make some phone calls, boy. Mm -hmm. Boy, I'd, oh, oh, man. But God hasn't given me a red button. He hasn't given me a nuclear code. He's given me the gospel. He said, now you take that into all the world. Amen. And until you die, you share it. You share with every man, woman, and child in every single nation, wherever they may be. No matter how evil you think they are. If I think you're evil, you better believe God knows you're evil, right? If you think you've got sin, believe me, God knows a whole lot more about our sins than we even admit ourselves. Amen? If you understand that, say amen. amen. Look, you can look at the person beside you. They think that they're pretty good. God knows all of our sins. And God doesn't tell us to go and tear them down. doesn't tell us to attack them. doesn't tell, tell us to, to just make them feel like they're, they're scum or anything like that. No. He tells us the scope of our ministry is this entire world to go and share the gospel. The specifics are very simple. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them what it means to be a believer. That's the role of the church. That's what we should be about doing. And the duration is until God calls us home or until we die physically. Just share it. Now, I'm going to close just by saying this because I know it's the truth. Not everybody in here is saved. Some preachers will manipulate you. I always hated it in church. I mean, I've been in churches where preachers did it. 
And if you'll close your eyes and bow your head and raise your hand if you need me to pray for you, I promise I won't call you out. And they lied. They call you out. Preacher did it to me once. Didn't work. But he did. I think I must have been the only one in church to raise my hand. I'm not sure because I was honest. I closed my eyes, I bowed my hand, and I raised my hand. The end of the service, the preacher says, Young man, I saw you raise your hand. Why don't you come up here? I'm thinking, You old man, you lied. I ain't coming. I wanted you to know that I needed prayer. I didn't want everybody else to know that I was a sinner. That was a secret. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your head and raise your hands. I'm not going to manipulate you. But I will tell you, either in that pew, in this altar, in your vehicle, or at your house, you can come to know Christ as your Savior. And I also want to tell you this, that if evangelism is supposed to be the priority of the church, as long as God gives me the blessing to be the pastor here at Green Sea, it will be our priority. We will share Christ with anybody and everybody at any time as God so leads. Amen? Amen? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for loving us. Your word has been presented. I pray, God, that you have spoken to hearts. You're the only one who can bring about change. And I pray that you would do your work according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. If you need